Step right up, step right up. That's right, folks. Come and have a look at the amazing Three Ring Circus. That's right, everything you could possibly imagine and more. Absolutely. As you step into the tent, suddenly everything that's in your imagination appears in front of you because I know what you want. Or do you? Hello. Welcome to this episode of How to Be a Great GM. Since the players have been looking at metagaming, someone asked me the question, is it entirely possible for the GM to metagame? And my immediate reaction was, of course, that's the whole point of being a GM. And then I realized there's far more to it than perhaps you might expect. We are the ringmasters, the ones who run the circus, and the players are merely the audience who are going along for the ride. Maybe they'll influence the outcome of who gets what custard pie thrown into whose face, or whether the elephant tramples the poor old uh, clown to death, but ultimately we're the ones who are responsible for making sure that everything remains consistent and that everything remains plausible. And it's here that metagaming meta becomes our greatest enemy. And there's a reason for that. There are three, in my opinion, levels to GM metagaming. One of them is fairly obvious. The other two take a little bit of thinking. And all three of them, all three of them, when they are individually occurring, the players might not notice once or twice. When they all occur together at the same time, the players will feel cheated, cheated, and cheated again. And it all comes down to the idea that as a GM, you are wearing three hats. Would have been better if I'd worn three different hats, but I don't have any. Imagine that there's a hat under this hat, and then there's a hat under this hat. You're a GM, use your imagination. Anyway, the first point of GM metagaming is the fact that you're a human, probably, and that you bring to the table everything that's in your little noggin, all the computer games that you've ever played, all the board games you've ever played, all the role-playing games you've ever played, all of the movies, all of the TV series, all of the books that you've ever read, all the plays you've ever watched or written. You bring all of that with you to a game. And so when you are creating your stories, when you are creating your master plot and your other plot lines, you are imbibing them all with that knowledge. Now that knowledge may be too metagame. Remember, you are responsible for designing a world or a space or interpreting a world or a module that has been created in situ. The world behind me, for example, Braxia, has mechanisms in place and mechanics in place based on what was available to those people. So player, human GM player, as in the player of the game who is the GM and is a human, human GM player metagaming is very bad and that results in you bringing specific knowledge to the game which may not necessarily have any reason for being there. You bring in some kind of technology which the players aren't aware of and which you can use against them but which they can't use because they're not expecting it. Laser beams in a fantasy setting, all of that sort of thing is a form of human GM metagaming. You think of ways that the players get stuck inside an asteroid field because your personal knowledge extends to astrophysics and quantum mechanics and the players' characters need to figure out this remarkably insidious little quantum mathematical trap that you've created for them. You know about it and you think it's fairly obvious because it's part of your day life. Everybody else thinks you're completely mad and doesn't derive any enjoyment out of the game because they don't know how to get out of it building some kind of trap in a fantasy environment that requires the characters to use reflective mirrors to bounce light around or to use prisms to split colors into different shades. That is modern science. It is not something that was around during the medieval era. And sure, gnomes may have done that beforehand and it might be gnomish knowledge. But again, it's a form of metagaming. It's a form of applying information that your brain knows today but wouldn't know at that specific time period. 
It's a very subtle form of metagaming, but it, one, it is one that can creep in time and time again. And what it does, and this is why it's so bad, is what it does is it forces players who are trying to be in the mindset of a coal miner in 1943, and suddenly he's presented with a touchscreen interface. It wouldn't make sense to him unless it was a science fiction setting, in which case it still shouldn't make sense to him. But if that's how you've built the Nazi underground bunker, it's a failure on your behalf. You're assuming knowledge that the players have, but that the characters don't have. So human GM player metagaming forces character player metagaming. And you don't want that. That's bad. It breaks the immersion. The second type of metagaming is GM knowledge. Now, GM knowledge is different from human GM knowledge. GM knowledge is the fact that you are sitting around a table, you are hearing the players go, oh, well, if we use a hot air balloon, we can sail over the castle and land in the courtyard and we would circumnavigate that entire gatekeep and all of the hidden dangers that are in that. You then go, oh, all right, there are anti-air ballista mounted on all the towers, so the moment they start getting close, I'm going to have them shot down. Why do they have anti-air ballistas mounted on top of all the towers? Are they frequently attacked by hot air balloons? If the answer is yes, then hopefully you've set it up before. But if the answer is no, you've just used GM knowledge to metagame a problem into existence for the characters. It's a bad thing. Because your players are going to get frustrated every time they try to come up with some kind of secret little plan to work around your mechanics that you put into place and that they have discovered through doing reconnaissance and, and, and. They will start to get frustrated. No turn that they take, no solution they come up with provides an easier outcome for them. Everything still becomes difficult because the GM is sitting back going, well, my Lord doesn't know that. My Duke doesn't know that. My enemy starship captain doesn't know that. My futuristic alien doesn't know that. But I know it. And so they've got these defenses prepared because, well, it's just going to make it more difficult for the players, characters to get through. That's GM knowledge metagaming. And that happens very, very often, especially if you are worried Oh, the players are coming up with a plan that's going to get them to avoid all my secret traps, all my riddles, all my... No, I will have a solution to keep them to go through my space. You're trying to metagame railroad them, which is even worse than just regular railroading, which I suppose is at least an honest form of thou shalt go here. So that's very bad. You don't want to use GM knowledge metagaming. Then finally, the last type of metagaming is known as the NPC Collective Hive Mind. It's where one NPC learns some information from the characters and then all NPCs have access to that information. It's the, oh, I tell a secret here, six continents over and suddenly someone walks up to me saying, oh, I hear that you sell rude shaped vegetables. You go, huh, I only told one little person on the other side of the world. That doesn't make sense. So the NPC collective is during a chase sequence and your little hacker is running down the sci-fi streets of New York. One NPC happens to recognize her and shout, stop that woman. And then four blocks later, 17 elevators, 14 flights of stairs, a hover car, and one by divergent teleportation to another building. The, in, the character comes running in the corner and the NPC says, Oi, I know it's you. Stop. How? How? How did that NPC know that this was this person? If she just steps out looking like anybody else. NPC hive mind, NPC collective is something that you have to avoid. And it's really difficult because you as the GM are playing all of these roles. You are the baker, the candlestick maker. You are the ringmaster. You are all the NPCs and you do know all the information. The trick is, is that you have to make sure that your NPCs don't. You have to make sure that your NPCs are as oblivious as possible. And sometimes, sometimes it can actually turn out to a benefit because your players need moments to breathe. Their characters have done stupid things, a.k.a. the players have done stupid things. Or the players are metagaming. And they're doing stupid things because they say, well, my character wouldn't know the right solution. I know the solution, but my character wouldn't. 
don't punish them for trying to avoid metagaming by metagaming yourself and making sure that everybody knows who the criminal is, everybody knows in what direction the characters were heading in, everybody's suspicious. So those are the three different types of metagaming. And I think that they are in the infancy in this video in terms of unpacking them and, and looking at how you can use them uh, as a negative or as a positive um, because you do have to use both. But the point is, is now that you're aware of the metagaming, you can now look at it and sit back and say, how can I use that as an advantage? How can I use that or how can I prevent myself from using that in the future? Or by looking at your campaign going, well, actually, yes. There is a lot of metagame knowledge required in order to interact with this campaign. And it doesn't make sense. Or, yes, I'm running a Babylon 5 game and people aren't responding to the shadow threat because they don't know what it is. They should be. They should be running away in fear, but the players have got their characters running towards them. Well, yes, because no one knew that they were evil or they were insidious or whatever the situation might be. So you've got to look at metagaming as a tool, as a weapon, as something to be avoided and as something to be encouraged and avoided by your players. And if you don't understand what I mean, go and watch the two player videos on metagaming. The next one comes out tomorrow on how to turn metagaming into a good situation and work with your players. Work with the metagaming space and turn it into a narrative space rather than into a oh well you don't know that because you were asleep work out some way that your npcs can have this collective let the players as their characters are wandering through the streets let the characters hear these whispered rumors of this strange blue-haired girl and oh i saw i saw her running that way and then someone else pipes up, no, she wasn't running that way. Oh, no, she went down that way. And then another one pipes up, you know, oh, no, she was wearing orange shoes and it got brown mud on them. That means she came from that alleyway over there. Let the players hear that there are NPC discussions happening all around them. And within one of those NPC discussions needs to be some kind of detective who's listening in or an unguarded mic that allows more people to know. And then bring it back. And let your players, when their characters meet the detective, go. Our informants in the city square told us that they had, this girl had mud on her shoes that matches your mud identically. You knew about it, and yet you brazenly walked around with it anyway. So you're using situations that you've set up, and you're almost accounting for where the metagaming comes from. And if you can do that, then your metagaming won't feel like metagaming, it will simply feel like very good storytelling. Well, I hope that's given you some insight into just what is metagaming and how you can use it and avoid it in your own games. And uh, if it did, hit that uh, like button. If you want to see more, hit that subscribe button. You can join us on Patreon. We're doing all sorts of interesting things there, like one-on-one -on -one discussions in terms of how to run your campaign, as well as running a weekly role-playing session with myself as a GM. And we've got some fantastic players already involved in that game. And you can join us at any time. You are welcome to. Until then, I wish you the happiest of gaming.